No one here is saying only hydro. I'm not. You're not. No one here is saying only nuclear. I'm not. You're not. No one here is saying only fracking. I'm not. You're not. No one here is saying only clean coal. I'm not. You're not. No one here is even saying no solar uh, and, and no, uh, no uh, uh, wind turbines. We're just saying it shouldn't be subsidized. But to the rest of the media, this conversation is that of two <laughs> radicals who need to be locked away. And that is concerning to me. Very happy now we have a return guest on the program. Yeah, yes, and it's do. always interesting when you have people like our next guest because the video goes up on YouTube and we don't do a lot of long form guest interviews. Yeah, not, not too often. Let alone for a second time. And you see this video, it goes up on YouTube. Of course, people who are Mug Club members, they, they enjoyed it. But the people on YouTube, they're split. And you see a lot of dislikes to likes and then the ratio just hits a tipping point and it switches when more people see it and they actually start looking up what the guest is Actually discussing. looking up the the stats that they exactly get. because you know this guy he, he's a doctor that means we're all a bunch of schlubs but you can follow him on the twitter as long as they allow him at ecosense now his book is confessions of a greenpeace dropout dr patrick moore thank you for being back sir great Stephen. nice to be with you again well, I, I'm really glad to have you back because uh, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about. And I know that you wrote an article uh, about 12 invisible eco-catastrophes and threats of doom that are actually fake. I'd like to get to those in a second. But last time we had you on, f first off, did you get a lot of feedback from your end in your, in your private inboxes? Or did you check out the comment section? Do you just avoid it? No, I, I generally do look at the comments section, and it was quite a lot of comments. Uh, you're right. There was some negatives at first, knee-jerk stuff and trolls. But in the end, it came out very positive because I am telling the truth. And if anybody can find something that I'm saying that they don't think is true, I would be very pleased to hear from them so I can correct it. The comments switched because immediately people have a knee-jerk reaction, like you said. They go, oh, this person is this person is a climate denier. Hit dislike until they realize, oh, hold on a second. One of the founding members of Greenpeace, a doctor, somebody who's actually studied this extensively. Uh, and then people started listening to what you uh, had to say. And I wanted to have you on for, for something specific that I noticed. You know, I spend a lot of, times in, uh, a lot of time in the Great Lakes region. And, um, you know, there at record highs right now. I remember Dick Durbin in 2013 saying they were going to dry up. And uh, fast forward a few years, some of them, I think, are at record highs. And I know others are at 17-year highs. And in contrast, what we talk about with climate change, wherever people line up personally, um, the region has had some of the best growing climates in decades. Uh, cherries are a very finicky crop. That's one thing that I know because we have family who work in cherries and it needs a very moderate, slow thawing winter. And they've actually had to dump cherries to price fix. So right away, I thought of you when we discussed climate change, a warming climate and more precipitation. H have you been following this? And I, I always wonder what the response is from the alarmists, regardless of where they line up on climate change, but the alarmism, if we're going, oh, hold on a second, the lakes are high and growing is fantastic. Well, they'll find some reason to say that it's bad that the lakes are overflowing, et cetera. You know, I mean, because now it's become that climate change is too hot and it's too cold and it's too wet and it's too dry. And then they make up that there's more tornadoes and hurricanes, which is false. And then they make up that there's more damage being caused by extreme weather, which is true because there's so much more um, infrastructure in the way of sure. extreme weather today because of the population growth and the growth of cities and all. Uh, so they, they'll find a way every time to point to something that they claim is out of the ordinary. And I have challenged these people in a general sense that there is nothing, absolutely zero nothing, in today's weather or climate that is anywhere near out of line with the last 10,000 years in this interglacial period since the ice caps melted the last time. And so th they've got to say, okay, no, there's the strongest this and the strongest that or the weakest this and the weakest that. They can't because nothing that is happening now is anywhere near out of ordinary with the ordinary. Well, that brings it's just me. there's extremes in every measure. You'll right. always find an extreme somewhere in the world going on. And that's all they do is cherry pick them now and it's really disingenuous of them because they started saying it's global warming and carbon dioxide is doing it. It was very simple what they said at the beginning. Sure. More CO2 from human fossil fuel consumption will increase the warming of the earth. Then they changed it to climate change, which now wasn't just warming. It was also cold yes. and dry and 
and, and, and wet and every other imaginable flooding and whatever all of a sudden was attributable to carbon dioxide. Even cold was attributable to carbon dioxide, even though the idea of CO2 being a greenhouse gas is the idea that it would make it warmer, right. not that it would make it colder. And then when the temperature stopped increasing at the rate it did during the 1990s, which, which we, was we, a, we both acknowledge. It was, hap- it was, it was increasing during yes. the 1990s. Yes, there you go. So was, just for people out there, not a denier, he's actually analyzing the data. We both agree on that. Good. <laughs> but this 1990s warming, beginning in actually the 80s, followed the cooling from the 1940s to the 1970s, in which if you go to the deplorable climate science blog of Tony Heller's, you will see just yesterday on the 10th of this month, he documented what they were saying then now and then a new age may be coming because it was cooling in the 60s and 70s yes then it started warming again and around 2000 the warming slowed down to a basically insignificant level yes. well- I believe we've. Co- I don't want to. I don't want to cut you up, but I believe we've covered this quite a bit in the in the first interview, and it was very interesting. And of course, there's still backlash no matter what. My my my, my uh, point of interest here is with the Great Lakes. It's moderate temperate climate climates, not super cold and not super hot in the summers. Slow thawing and record crop yields to the point where we're dumping cherries out because we want to fix the prices. It, 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 it to me it is mind boggling. But this does bring us to a bigger point, which you wrote about in your article. Um, what what do you think of the new trend? I, I, you know what? Maybe I'm ignorant. Maybe it's not a new trend, but it seems as though science right now is bowing to activism quite a bit, and that's kind of what you're speaking about, where 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 science is often used to silence whatever contradicts its initial hypothesis. And a good example of this is right now, if people are watching this on YouTube, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, YouTube now puts fact check links on all videos about people who might be climate change skeptics, as they put them, uh, in order to debunk them. So right now it could be appearing. I have no idea at what point in this video. What do you think about science bowing to political pressure? Is that a real problem? Yes, it is a real problem. Like when Galileo was put under house arrest for, the, for his life for saying that the earth went around the sun. And the same thing is happening now. People are claiming that CO2 is the main driver of climate change, global warming. And now it isn't even climate change. It's extreme weather events. They used to say, oh, that's not climate. That's just the weather. When you said, oh, it was really cold or read something, you know, that, that sort of contradicted right. the global warming scenario. And, and now all they do is talk about extreme weather. When they were telling us not to confuse weather with climate yes. about 10 years ago. It was used to actually make people look like, a, make anybody look like a simpleton. They'd go, oh, you're confusing climate and weather. And of course, that uh, ruined Thanksgiving dinner. Did you, have you heard, uh, by the way, the recent, a good example, the, the hoax academic paper, it claimed that penises cause climate change? Were, were you up on this? I did hear about that, and I looked down and uh. could not see any causal relationship at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's more of a it's more of a climate detector. It's a veritable climate stick, I guess, for <laughs> oh, yeah, them yeah. interchangeably. But um, it, it, it's it's pretty funny. They just used a bunch of climate jargon uh, to associate penises with worsening climate change. But the funny part, I don't think a lot of people know about this. It actually was published in a peer-reviewed academic journal. They were tricked. Yeah. That to me is, I mean, that really is Orwellian type scary as a non-scientist. Well, you know, at my age, actually, Stephen, any cause effect relationship related to that part of my anatomy would be welcome. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, 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 there'll be a different doctor who I'll have on uh, on a private <laughs> Skype after this. But um, I mean, how does that happen? How does something like as someone who's been in this uh, industry for a long time and obviously the work that you've done as a doctor, how does something like this get published? We always talk about peer reviewed papers published in a peer reviewed journal. How does something that was fraudulent by design make it through? What's the process like? How are they screening? <laughs> it, it, it's completely corrupted in that almost all the peer review is being done by people's buddies who are on the same wavelength as they are. And, and, and actually, most of the peer-reviewed journals have been taken over by journalists. Used to be peer-reviewed mm-hmm. science journalists were run by scientists who had a flair for publishing and for the language and, you know, could read and write. But... These, these people in charge of the science journals now are leftist journalists to a large extent. And they just have a barrier against anything that questions the uh, litany or the, the, the truth squad. 
and as they call themselves, but they're not the truth squad. They're the don't let the truth out squad. This has been, I'm on the west coast of, of British Columbia here. This has been one of the biggest wild berry years I have seen. It is actually the biggest one I've ever seen. Mm. Black blackberries, which are gone wild here, they're not native to here. Huckleberries, salmon berries, salal berries, those are all native here. I've never seen anything like it. And it isn't just the warmth. As a matter of fact, I think the warming is a minor component of the record crop productions that are going on in grains and all kinds of other commodities around the world. It's the increase in carbon dioxide, which is fertilizing all of the green plants around the world and making them grow faster and yield more. That's the biggest part of it. And it's been more or less proven with satellites from about six different research groups around the world in Europe, in Australia, in the United States. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, there's a bit of a disconnect in NASA and NOAA because there are people in both those organizations who are looking at the fertilization effect of CO2 on the greening of the earth, as it's called. The, the earth. Now, would that be a quick question from a simpleton? Would that be directly just because of CO2's chemical structure? Or are you talking about it leading to more precipitation, which would help, obviously, with the soil? No, I'm talking about it as a food for plants. CO2 okay. is the primary food for plants. Right. Uh, water is, the, is also like carbon dioxide and water put together make sugar, glucose. That's the basis of the energy for all life on Earth, because we have to we eat the plants or we eat animals that have eaten the plants. It all comes up from photosynthesis and the combination of carbon dioxide and water to make sugar. And this is where the demonization of carbon dioxide is so outrageously off base, because carbon dioxide is the basis of all organic life on Earth. That is where the carbon comes from in carbon-based life. And we are carbon-based life, and so is all the rest of the life on Earth. And if there wasn't any CO2 in the global atmosphere, there would be no life. Not only, not only if there wasn't any, if there wasn't a certain amount, because just like anything, there can be too little of it. That, that's my pivotal question here, because I can hear skeptics right now saying, well, hold on a second, we're not saying all carbon dioxide is bad. We're saying that we are out of balance now, that the ratio is too high of carbon dioxide. Um, so what, what is the amount that would be optimal, I guess, and, and how close or how far away are we from it? Because I, I know that that's where a lot of the nuanced debate occurs, and they just claim that obviously non-scientists as myself uh, are not entitled to an opinion. So I'll listen to yours. Well, one of the most uh, concrete ways in which you can see what the optimum level for plant growth is, is both experimentation in labs and greenhouse growers. All greenhouse growers around the world increase the CO2 level in their greenhouse to increase the productivity up to 40 to 60 percent of the crops in there and to make them grow faster to come to fruition sooner, shorter time of, of growth, in other words. And that, that's around 800 to 2,000 parts per million. Now, greenhouse growers don't put 2,000 ppm in because there's a law of diminishing returns. At first, you get really great increases from 400 to 800, and even from 800 to 1,000 or 1,200. After right. that, the curve starts to go off, but it still goes up. Okay. So in nature, where they're not worried about profits and diminishing returns, in nature, the optimum level is somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 parts per million, whereas now it's 400, and before we came along it was 280, and at the height of the last glaciation, because the seas, when they cool, absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, it was at 180 parts per million, which is only 30 parts per million above where plants begin to die, at 150 ppm. And during the last glaciation, the high elevation plants did die, that is pretty well demonstrated. And the reason they died is because the higher you go, the thinner the air becomes. And so 150 parts per million is occupying a much larger volume at elevation. And therefore, the plants can't get enough CO2 to survive. So we were, talk about not being in balance. CO2 has been declining for 150 million years on a relatively steady basis. Right. You can, the graphs are all available for anybody to see. And it's very well proven through ice cores and oxygen 18 proxies in ocean sediments and etc cetera, etc cetera, stonehenge the co2 has been declining steadily actually for the last 500 million years but let's just take the last 150 million where it has been steadily declining without any upward blips there was a huge flux of co2 into the atmosphere in the early earth then when species learned to do photosynthesis and use that carbon dioxide 
to make sugars, they started taking it out of the atmosphere. But it wasn't until about 40 or 50 million years ago that it started to go into a danger zone. And it just keeps going down and down and down until we came along, whereas the marine calcifying organisms inadvertently, by building an armor plating for themselves, a very useful thing to do for their survival, presaged the end of life on Earth through the loss of carbon dioxide in yeah, the atmosphere. But screw, the screw them, Al Gore has another Learjet to get to. I do, I understand exactly where you're, where you're going with this, but here's kind of the, the issue that we run into, right? Is what you're saying, obviously, we'll, we'll have overlays for people. Um, people can look up for themselves and, and obviously decide whether they believe it to be legitimate or not. There's something that is legitimate, there's truth, and then you can choose to believe truth, unfortunately. Um, but, yes. but the issue is that everything you're saying doesn't break through and so many, even YouTube, like we just talked about themselves, will dismiss you simply as a quack, as a denier, without listening to what you have to say. So I, I wanna go back to something that you just mentioned, which to me is obviously of, of the utmost importance because it ties into a lot of the cultural issues that we've discussed, cultural Marxism, the censorship of speech, we see it in comedy now, but it really concerns me when you start to see it in science. You mentioned that a lot of these peer-reviewed journals were, were once peer-reviewed by scientists and now often by uh, activist journalists. Can, can, do you have or, any examples? Activist, activist scientists. Or activist the, the, scientists, yes. The journalists control the journals yes. large these days. The activists control the science, so called. Right. When they say climate science, right, or climate scientists, they mean themselves. Yes. They don't mean any, everybody who's studying the climate. Because people who are studying the climate who don't agree with them are considered deniers, not climate scientists. Exactly. I'm talking about the peer-reviewed journals like we were discussing, and you said there's been a shift there. When did that shift occur? Because for a long time, again, Americans had to rely on certain systems and power that they believed to be truthful. When would you say that shift uh, occurred, and do you have any, uh, I guess, particular egregious examples that we could make? Beginning 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it was, it was over by, you know, 20 years ago pretty well. And, and it's and that's what we've been being fed since, is basically a very filtered uh, set of ideas. The idea that CO2 is the main driver of climate change and global warming is the centerpiece. Right. And, and it is, that is false. There is no possibility that any substance in that small a quantity, 0.04% of the atmosphere, could be the controlling factor of the whole global climate. The sun is the controlling factor of the whole global climate, but it is moderated by many other factors. And qu factors. quick question, you said, you said 0.4%, how much of that is- 0.04%. 0.04%, how much of that is human, is man-made? Well, that, that's a question of whether you're looking at it as how much of the CO2 in the atmosphere today was caused by humans versus how much of the CO2 in the flux is caused by humans. It's, right. It's sort of like in, in, in economics, you have a cash flow statement and you have a balance sheet. Right. On the balance sheet right now, CO2 has gone from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million, about a 40% increase since humans started emitting significant amounts of CO2, okay. mostly since 1950. Right. There's been an exponential curve of emissions, but there hasn't really been an exponential curve of CO2 levels in the atmosphere. That's a fairly straight line. And that indicates that much of the CO2 we are emitting is being absorbed by the vegetation of yeah. the earth, because that's that's what eats CO2. That's what and I wanted to get to, because that to me is, I think this is kind of a bait and switch that occurs with a lot of people. Again, being someone who's not a scientist, but who's, who's read as best I can, uh, yeah, there has been there have been drastic increases, certainly in human emissions. But like you said, I think it's very interesting if people look it up and see that as you've dis discussed, the overall levels of CO2 in the earth's climate do not necessarily, necessarily correlate. They've been pretty consistent. And that to me, was one of the most remarkable findings uh, during my research into this issue. And, and I, I just highly encourage that everyone else out there go and, and do that research. Let me, let me ask you, I wanna go back to the journalism issue because again, this is very important. It doesn't matter, we can, we can scream until we're blue in the face uh, about the truth if no one is there to hear it, if we get shut down. And that's why the deplatforming is, is so dangerous. Why do you think it is? Why did this happen? Uh, happened? Uh, now this will definitely be demonetized. Why did this happen with peer reviewed journals? I mean, 
a good example. We, we kind of want to see it right now uh, with the BDSM or, um, you know, Brown just removed a study on rapid onset gender dysphoria, for example. They, they removed an actual study, an actual, you know, we're talking about clinical studies, medical observations. We kind of see what's happening there, for example, on the gender science uh, due yep. to political correctness. But why do you think this occurred starting 30 years ago, uh, according to your kind of approx your approximation? Why? What's what is the why here behind this and this trend, this transition so recently? Well, the, the, the real problem is there are five powerful elites in our society who benefit from this myth. Okay. The myth of carbon dioxide, da, da, da. And, and it, it depends on what's five or six, depending on whether you think the media and Hollywood are two separate elites or whether they are one elite. Right. Uh, but starting at the top with the green movement itself, the fundraising around this issue has been hundreds of billions of dollars over the years. Then you come to the politicians who benefit from the idea that they can save the citizens from this catastrophe, right? right. It's, the catastrophe is made up by the green movement and the media ba basically being an echo chamber for it. The media needs sensationalism, especially the print media these days, but all media is giving in to internet these right. days. So the, the big media, uh, mainstream media, is all under threat right. because of digital media, internet media, social media, all that stuff. A, a perfect so example that for people, by the way, doubting, just to back up what you're saying here, uh, cherries are a good example because only a few years ago uh, in northern Michigan, this I experienced this personally, remember, uh, the trees thawed, right? There was a thaw and then it froze again later. You know, it was a later winter freezing. And so there, it was horrible for the cherry crop. And it was all over the news. Record high cherry yields to the point that they're dumping cherries, not a peep. You have to do a lot of research to find that out because it doesn't sell papers as much as cherries might be gone uh, due to climate change. We actually read those articles if you go and read local Michigan publications. So I just wanted to to, to drive that one home because uh, I'm sure a lot of people can think of specific instances so we, in their we, life. So we've got the green movement, the media, mm -hmm. and the politicians who can promise to save people from certain doom. Right. And their children and their grandchildren, of course. Paris Accord. And then, and then there's the green businesses, Elon Musk, mm -hmm. right? Tesla and all of that. People are not going Sucking. to like this, but continue. <laughs> but continue. I can already hear the, the comments. <laughs> the wind and solar, short Tesla right now, because he's done, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. And same with wind and solar. The vast quantities of money and tax credits and subsidies and guaranteed profits that have gone into these to prop them up, it would never have happened otherwise in any world there is. It's completely stupid what's been done. If people want clean energy, they should go nuclear and hydroelectric where it is available. Right. But to, to and gas, clean gas, and now clean coal, because they have learned with scrubbers and precipitators and all of these technologies to make the exhaust coming out from a coal plant very clean from a pollution point of view. But they call CO2 a pollutant when in fact it is the main food for all life on Earth. We yeah. need to separate those two things. Separate, how about separating poison from primary nutrient of all life on Earth? That would be a logical separation as far as I'm concerned. And then- it seems then logical comes, when you put it that way, yes. Yeah, then comes the scientists, virtually all of whom in the climate scientist category as they like, they self-described uh, clique of climate scientists are almost all I, I would almost say 100%, close to 100% on taxpayer money. This $100 billion climate fund that, you know, the first guy to line up for it after the Paris Agreement was Mugabe from Zimbabwe, right? right? And he claimed that climate change had destroyed the agricultural industry in Zimbabwe. It might have had something to do with him kicking out all the people who actually knew how to farm. Could. It could be related. Yeah, there could be some correlation there. I'll give you that. But in the case of the Paris Agreement, it's just a goody two-shoes document. Yeah. It has nothing to do with anything that is actually going to happen.
Because and that's first, assuming, by the way, that's assuming that you believe carbon dioxide to be poison. And that's assuming, exactly. by the way, that you believe if everyone followed the rules, that it would somehow fix this problem of climate change. If you assume those things, then you can look at this bill, of course, which, which would cost countries billions upon billions of dollars, not to mention the millions of lives in third world countries. Uh, and you also have to go along the logic trail, assuming that China is going to play ball. Yeah, we'll get right on that. That's their top priority right now. No, well, they were actually specifically exempt along with India right from the right. beginning. Right. Obama went over to China and negotiated a, a historic climate deal with the Chinese that they wouldn't have to do anything until 2030, which might as well be infinity. Why? And, well, because they wanted them to vote for it. If you, if we, <laughs> but why, why should they get to vote? And a, a lot, they're completely exempt. I understand that's why we wanted them to vote. For they had it. to vote because they were one of the countries in the world. Yes, I know and they're so, one of the countries in the world, but they're going to pull <laughs> themselves out of this agreement. To me, it is, it is, it's like having a current felon who is in prison voting on the laws of felonies. It is unreal to me. And the reason I'm saying this, yes, does it sound absurd? I'm trying to make the point that people need to understand we needed the vote of a country who had no plan in taking part in the law to begin with. That is nonsensical to me, even if you believe everything else leading up to that point. And I think most people don't even know this. There is no evidence that any country, I mean any, not one country, has made an effort to live up to the Paris Agreement. Right. None. They're all just going about their business as usual. The United States, in fact, has reduced its CO2 emissions since the year 2000 more than any other country in the world yeah. without any Paris Accord or Kyoto Protocol. And that's largely because of the conversion from coal to gas due to the fracking industry. And the Greens are against fracking, along with nuclear energy, which has no CO2 emissions, and hydroelectric energy. Apparently, they don't like lakes. There are too many lakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? That leads to, uh, obviously, there are issues with dams. That leads to Tom Selleck stealing water for his avocados. I grew up in Quebec. Well, people would say we 